ParanoiaCon 2013. Our next speaker is Ralph Epperson, a researcher, historian, and author who has published four books and produced 19 DVDs. He will be speaking this afternoon on the subject of an introduction to the conspiratorial view of history. Mr. Epperson has twice been a guest on the History Channel and has lectured all over the United States for some 28 years and has been the guest on close to 500 talk shows in the past seven years. Two of his books have been published in six foreign nations, and he was stunned when an independent publisher in communist China asked for and received permission to publish his book entitled The Unseen Hand in that nation. And just a month ago, he gave permission to a publisher in Indonesia, basically a Muslim country, to publish the same title. He has said that he was honored to be included in Victor Thorne's first ever Conspiracy Hall of Fame, along with some of the greatest conspiracy writers of all time, like Anthony Sutton, Jim Mars, and Commander William Guy Carr. This afternoon, he will be bringing some of his 50 years of research into the conspiratorial view of history. And lastly, Mr. Epperson has asked that you hold your questions and comments until after he has concluded his remarks. Please welcome Mr. Ralph Epperson. I want to thank you for coming to hear me this afternoon. It is always a pleasure to speak before a live audience, to bounce my ideas off of you, and to hear your comments. I first spoke to a Paranoia Magazine audience maybe 20 years ago when they were on the East Coast, and I welcome the opportunity to do it again today. When you are an internationally recognized author, such as I am, you get invitations to speak all over the world. I recently returned from a speaking engagement in Sweden, and as usual, they provided me with a name tag. They took my name of Ralph Epperson and translated it into Swedish so that many of the attendees would be able to recognize me. And here is that name tag. <laughs> I was told that it is pronounced Eustaklutz, but I was reassured that this is the Swedish spelling of the name of Ralph Epperson. Uh, now, now, I know what you're thinking. How could this klutz get selected into the Conspiracy Hall of Fame? Well, stay tuned. You might be able to answer that question by the time I finish. Let me start by briefly defining the two views of history. The first is called the accidental view of history. And this view holds that the major events happened by accident for no apparent reason, and that rulers are powerless to prevent them. Things just happen for no determinable cause. The second view is called the conspiratorial view of history. And this view holds that the major events happened by design after years of planning for reasons not generally made known to the public. I first started my research in 1962, a couple of years after my graduation from the University of Arizona. I can assure you that what I believe today was not offered to me in any course I was enrolled in for four years of my life. It has come after the reading of over 1,100 books on both sides of this issue. And I would summarize my views today with these words. My research has proven to me that a huge, extremely powerful, worldwide conspiracy has been working to achieve absolute rule over the entire human race by using wars, depressions, inflations, and revolutions to achieve their aims. Let me give you a dictionary definition of the word conspiracy. A conspiracy is two or more people meeting in secret with an evil plan. And the next word I would like to define is the word inflation. 
It is an increase in the my supply, and it always causes a rise in the price level. So inflation has a cause and an effect. The cause is an increase in the my supply, and the effect is a rise in prices. I would next like to discuss another example of how money can be used to destroy. The word is called hyperinflation, where the supply of money is increased so rapidly to such an extent that it takes millions or even billions of the currency to buy even the most insignificant profit product. An example of hyperinflation is occurring right now in Zimbabwe, the African nation formerly known as Rhodesia. <laughs> this is a picture of a Zimbabwean trillionaire holding up a 100 trillion Zim dollar in January 2011. The tourists in Zimbabwe can purchase one for five American dollars. That is an example of how money can be used to destroy an economy. There is an opposite word that I would like next to define, and that is the word deflation. A deflation is a decrease in the money supply, causing prices to drop. President James Garfield addressed the issue with this comment. Whoever controls the volume of money is absolute master of all industry and commerce. In early America, it was the people who controlled the volume of money by discovering gold, which was real money. But there were others who wanted to control the volume of money, and they were called central bankers. And here is why. If you control, totally control the quantity of money, you can sell when the price is high. Decrease the volume of money to lower prices and then buy when the prices are at their lowest. And then increase the volume of money to cause prices to rise, and then you can sell and repeat the process. This control enables the bankers to make enormous profits simply by controlling the money supply. So in summary, then, there are only two groups who can have the ability to increase the money supply either the central bankers or the people. When the people lose the control of the money supply and they print money to put it into the marketplace, it is called counterfeiting, and it is illegal. And those who counterfeit are punished by the government. When the government increases the money supply, it is called funding the deficit and no one goes to prison. Yes, notice this. The crime is identical to the crime of counterfeiting. It is increasing the money supply with money created out of nothing. Now let me show you who has the control of the volume of money here in the United States. The Federal Reserve provided me a copy of their own book when I attended the University of Arizona and took a class called Money and Banking. It was called the Federal Reserve System Purposes and Functions, as you can see. And it says this on chapter in Chapter 1 on page 1. The function of the Federal Reserve System is to foster a flow of credit and money. Now that I've laid down some economic principles, I would now like to start an examination of the history of America. And I would like to urge you to be open and listen to all of the evidence before you reach a verdict, because this information is extremely important to an understanding of just why this nation is in trouble. The first step in the process of creating a central bank occurred shortly after the American Revolution that started in 1776, after we declared our independence from Great Britain. After the revolution ended, the American government was faced with an enormous debt, and a method to solve that crisis was brought into the arena of public debate. There were two able and eloquent nationally known speakers on the subject, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. 
Jefferson was opposed to the creation of a national or central bank, and Hamilton was in favor. Thomas Jefferson warned the American people with these words, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. But the most prophetic of Jefferson's ideas is this one. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. This means we should not borrow to pay the deficits of our government. A principle which, if acted on. Now please listen to how he was warning the future generations in America about the result of borrowing to pay deficits. A principle which, if acted on, would save one half of the wars of the world. This man was warning us, Americans, but we have not listened, and our past has been plagued by wars created by central bankers in their attempts to force us into the creation of a central bank, as you will see as I continue. Simply stated, Jefferson was warning us central bankers cause wars to create debt. After the Constitution was written in 1787, the first government of the United States was created in 1789 with George Washington as the first president. But he appointed Alexander Hamilton the first secretary of the Treasury and Two years later, in 1791, the United States government granted a 20-year charter to the First Bank of the United States. This bank was privately owned, had the power to print paper money, and loan it to the government at interest. The charter ran for its 20-year term and was not renewed by the administration of President James Monroe. But the government had paid off the debt of the American Revolution. So after 1811, the United States had no central bank, so the bankers planned the war of 1812 between England and the United States. They thought that this would convince the Americans to create a permanent central bank. And to solve the national debt created by the expense of this war, the second bank of the United States was created in 1816 with a 20-year charter, meaning it would expire in 1836. The renewal of the 20-year charter became a smoldering issue when President Andrew Jackson ran for re-election in 1832. His campaign platform was simple. He ran with this statement, Jackson and no bank, or bank and no Jackson. He told Martin Van Buren, his vice president, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And sure enough, on January the 30th, 1835, a would-be assassin named Richard Lawrence stepped into his path and fired two pistols at him at close range. Fortunately, both weapons misfired and Jackson was unharmed. Lawrence later claimed that he had been, quote, in touch with the powers in Europe which had promised to intervene if any attempt was made to punish him, unquote. So the central bankers had planned two separate wars and still had not created a permanent central bank. But they thought that they had softened America enough that a third war would be sufficient to create the need for a permanent central bank. And they faced the fact that had become evident during the War of 1812. America was building a navy, and this would increase the hazards in supplying any army the Europeans would send to fight another war in America. They realized that the 3,000 miles of the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and the United States had become an insurmountable obstacle. 
Then they realized that Canada and Mexico were not large enough to attack the United States, but there was an issue that they could utilize to create a war between the states, and that issue was slavery. Slavery. This issue had festered in America ever since it started in the 16th century. The European Central Bankers started planning a civil war in America, and their plans resolved around an organization they created in 1837 called the Knights of the Golden Circle. Members were sent to the United States to spread secession amongst the states so that it would provoke a war between the North and the South. I've read various estimates of the number of members from a low of 14,000 to a high of 1 million. The next step was the election of Abraham Lincoln in the election of 1860, and he was inaugurated on March the 4th on the next year. The activities of the European bankers were successful, and on the civil end, the Civil War started on April the 12th, 1861, when the South fired on Fort Sumter, a northern fort in South Carolina. And I would now like to give you the Epperson version of what transpired next. I believe the European bankers met with Lincoln and asked him how he was going to pay for the enormous cost of the war. And I believe Lincoln would have said something like, I don't know, I've got very little taxing power, so I'm in a quandary. And I think the bankers would have said, gee, uh, President Lincoln, you're really lucky. We're in the banking business, and we could loan you the money, and you could pay for the costs of the war. And Lincoln, I know, would have said, at what interest rate? And the bankers would have said 36%. And Lincoln then said, don't, don't call me, I will call you. And he issued the greenback dollar. It was, catch this, it was not borrowed and had no gold redemption behind the bill, meaning it was not backed by gold reserves. He issued a total of $450 million of these greenbacks to pay for the costs of the war. In 1963, Congressman Wright Patman, the chairman of the House Banking Committee, asked the Secretary of the Treasury to determine how much money was saved in interest payments by his issuing the greenback. The Secretary of the Treasury responded, If the money had been borrowed for 100 years from 1863 to 1962, to reduce the amount of annual payments, the amount of interest paid would have exceeded $49 billion. The amount of interest paid would have exceeded $49 billion. Lincoln printed $450 million in greenbacks, and the interest he saved was $49 billion. Thank you, President Lincoln. So the bankers got the war they wanted, but failed in their attempt to get Lincoln to either borrow from them or create a central bank that they would own. But to give Lincoln credit, he quickly discovered that the central bankers in England and France were supporting the South by sending them the essential weapons of war that could be shipped to the South in exchange for cotton. But Lincoln wisely determined that the quickest way to defeat your enemy was to cut off their supplies. So he imposed a blockade on all of the southern states just a few days later on April the 19th, 1861. This gave rise to the growth of southern blockade runners who were successful in skirting the blockade to bring war, war essentials into the ports of the south at huge profits. I remember reading somewhere that the South guaranteed a successful blockade runner double the price when they offloaded their cargo. One of the most successful of these blockade runners was Junius Morgan, the father of J.P. Morgan, who made an immense fortune in successful blockade running into the South. This was the base 
of J.P. Morgan's enormous wealth, and Morgan parlayed it into his being one of the wealthiest men in the United States. But to counter the blockade, the South signed contracts with shipbuilders in England and France to purchase huge ships capable of being so powerful that no northern ship could get close enough to prevent them from visiting their port. And once Lincoln became aware of this, he determined that he needed a naval ally and won quickly. He looked to other European nations, but he quickly discovered that there was only one European nation without a central bank, and that was the nation of Russia. The nation also had the largest navy at the time, and he arranged for their navy to visit ports in the north and in California as a sign of their support of Lincoln's government. The Russian admirals of these ships had instructions from Tsar Alexander II that they were to be ready to fight any power that chose to run the blockade of the north. One of the evidences of Russia's involvement in the Civil War is this. The city of Baltimore issued this proclamation in October of 1863, welcoming the fleet to the northern ports. A second source is a photograph taken by Matthew Brady, perhaps the greatest photographer of the events of the Civil War. It was taken of the Russian ship called the Osliaba while it was in the port of Alexandria, Virginia. These two sources are part of the documentation for the appearance of the Russian ships in northern ports. You might want to see how many history books on the Civil War even mention this fact. When I did my research for my book, The Unseen Hand, I could find not one, not one. Once the ships showed up in 1863, England and France canceled the contracts, apparently because they considered a war with Russia to be very expensive and fruitless. And the war started to come to an end, and it did on April the 9th, 1865. I would like to take a step out of the chronological sequence of events to discuss an event that happened two years later in 1867. After Lincoln's assassination, Vice President Andrew Johnson became president, and two years later he received a bill for $7.2 million for the use of the fleet. Johnson had to find a way to give a foreign nation American taxpayers' money. He knew that Congress had no authority, no authority, to give one dollar to a foreign nation, because there's no authority for Congress to give foreign aid to any foreign nation. But he did have one way to accomplish this. He could buy land. America had paid France $15 million in the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. So Johnson bought land, meaning Alaska, for $7.2 million. See if you can find this in your history books, and I will say you will not find any. Now back to the sequence of events. President Lincoln decided to celebrate the ending of the war by making an appearance in Forge Theater in Washington, D.C. on the night of April the 14th, 1865. And it was the night that John Wilkes Booth assassinated him. The Secretary of War, Edwin P. Stanton, took charge of the search for Booth and quickly sent troops to the roads out of Washington, D.C. to prevent anyone from leaving the city. There were eight of them, and inadvertently, I am certain, he failed to send troops to the Navy Yard Bridge, which led to Maryland and then to Virginia, a southern state. But certainly, by coincidence, I'm certain that it is the one that Booth took to get out of the city. The president was not the only one scheduled to be assassinated that night. Of course, they planned on assassinating Lincoln, but also three other people. Vice President Andrew Johnson, 
Secretary of State William Seward, and General Ulysses S. Grant. If all of these attempts had been successful that night, it is quite likely that Secretary of War Edwin P. Stanton would have become President of the United States. But the only successful assassination that night was of Abraham Lincoln. Now this might explain why the Navy Yard Bridge was not secured after Lincoln was assassinated. Maybe Stanton could become President of the United States by assisting in the assassination of these four leaders. This is a book entitled The Assassination and History of the Conspiracy by Bert James Lowenberg. It was originally printed only four months four months after the assassination of the president in 1865 and it reported the order meaning the Knights of the Golden Circle originated the plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln yet I defy you to find one reference to them in nearly any book or textbook you will read about the Civil War the Knights have been officially buried so the war ended and the bankers had not succeeded in getting their central bank. So the Knights of the Golden Circle and certain high-ranking members of the Masonic Lodge created the Ku Klux Klan in 1867. And their plan was to create racial riots in the South between the blacks and the whites to foment another civil war. The admitted organizer of the KKK was General Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Southern general and a one-time member of the Masonic Lodge. Albert Pike, another Southern general and the leader of the worldwide Masonic movement, became the chief judicial officer of the KKK. Another member of the Masons and of the Knights of the Golden Circle was Jesse James, the famous outlaw. Jesse later became the head of the Knights until it was officially dissolved in 1903. And to conceal their involvement, the Masons who assisted in the formation of the KKK included a code inside the name of the KKK itself. K is the 11th letter of the English language as you can see by this table. There are three K's in the name Ku Klux Klan and three times 11 is obviously 33, a hidden recognition of the 33rd degree of masonry, just another coded example of their involvement in our lives. Just like so many facts in this case, the truth was there for all those who cared enough to discover it themselves. All of this documentation of these statements is contained in my DVD entitled Jesse James Lived to Be 103. The Second Civil War never came off and I am still not certain as to why it did not. I can find no explanation from any historian on this issue. So the road to a permanent central bank in the United States did not come as a result of a war. Each of these three wars had not been able to get the American government to create a central bank. So the bankers changed their strategy. They created bank runs in 1873, 1893, and 1907, each one to convince the American people that bankers were not honest and America needed a central bank. I think it is now important to give you a, sem a simple explanation of what a bank run is to show you how the international bankers use them as a way of convincing the American people that America needed a central bank. Let's just say that nine of my friends and I decide to create a bank that we're going to call the last bank of Tucson, here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we didn't have any money for capital improvements, but we did get a great price on the rental of this magnificent building. Uh, we thought it was a nice touch that the banking, the building, nice touch that the building had a covered walkway where we could get our horses out of the sun when we went into the bank to conduct our business. We each contributed a thousand dollars, so our beginning capital was ten thousand dollars. 
Let's just say that each of us goes into the bank a year later to withdraw our $1,000, but none of us knew the others were going to do that as well. The bank manager that we hired would tell each of us that he could not honor any of our individual requests because he simply did not have the money on hand. He would explain that, like any other bank, he had made loans to others who needed the money. We would insist that he call the individuals he loaned the money to and ask them to return the money he had loaned them. The manager would say that each of those individuals would say that they no longer had the money because they had given it to someone else and that they, in turn, didn't have it any longer either for the same reason. <laughs> this is called a bank run when a bank does not have the money on hand to pay all of the depositors at the same time. The reason is simple. Bankers make loans from the money their depositors have placed in a savings account. That means that a bank normally only has a small percentage of the deposit money on hand at any one time. If the story of what happened in Tucson got out to other depositors in America, that a local bank was denying their depositors their money, many other citizens would race to their bank to withdraw their money because they thought their bank could also be insolvent. And when they did, they would discover that their bank also had made loans and didn't have the money any longer either. This would start a nationwide bank run. And the international bankers would then declare that all of these local banks were being run by a bunch of crooks. And what this nation needed would be, guess what, America, a central bank. America needs a central bank. As I've said, bank runs have happened at least three times in America's past after the Civil War in 1873, 1893, and 1907. This is a photograph taken during the bank run of 1907 when all of these depositors came to the Knickerbocker Bank in New York City demanding their money and the bank had admitted that they no longer could honor their requests. And when J.P. Morgan, the nation's leading banker at the time, suggested that a central bank was needed, the American people allowed the international bankers to create the Federal Reserve Banking System in 1913. And the fact that it was international banker J.P. Morgan who had started the rumor, the rumor that the Knickerbocker Bank was insolvent when he knew it wasn't, was quickly buried in the turmoil created during the bank run of 1907. So in 1913, the international bankers finally got what they wanted, a privately owned bank that had the power to print paper money out of nothing, loan it to the government at interest. It is called the Federal Reserve, but it is not federal. We know that for certain that it is privately owned, but we just do not know who owns it. So I'm hoping that you can see that there was a common thread through the period of 1776 to 1913 the need of the European central bankers to create a permanent central bank in America. There were very few in Congress who spoke out in opposition to the creation of the Federal Reserve, but one was Congressman Charles Lindbergh, the father of the so-called aviator by the same name. He expressed his concerns about this act with these strong words. This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, he's talking about President Woodrow Wilson, the invisible government, notice he called it the invisible government, by the money power, will be legitimized. The new law will create inflation whenever the trusts want inflation. From now on, depressions will be scientifically created. I'm going to repeat that because of the importance of what he was saying. From now on, depressions will be scientifically created. And to show that the congressman's predictions were correct, 
America suffered through two Great Depressions shortly after the Federal Reserve was created. The first was in 1920, and the second was in 1929. It is interesting that most Americans have heard of the crash of 1929, but few, if any, know anything about the crash of 1920, and there is a very important reason why. This is the fall 2009 edition of a magazine called the Intercollegiate Review, called a Journal of Scholarship and Opinion. And this is an article starting on page 22, entitled Warren G. Harding and the Forgotten Depression of 1920. I would like to quote several brief paragraphs from this article because there is an important lesson contained therein. The article starts, the economic situation in 1920 was grim. By that year, unemployment had jumped from 4% to nearly 12%. The gross national product had declined 17%. But in November of that year, Warren G. Harding was elected President of the United States. The article continues. In his 1920 accepting speech of the presidential, uh, Republican presidential nomination, Harding declared, We will strike at government which borrowing we will strike at government borrowing, which enlarge the evil, and we will attack the very high cost of government with every energy. We promise to attend to the halting of waste and extravagance. It will be an example to stimulate thrift and economy in private life. President Harding cut the government's budget nearly in half between 1920 and 1922. Tax rates were slashed for all income groups. The national debt was reduced by one third. By the late summer of 1921, just a few months after he was elected, signs of recovery were already visible. He was elected in early, uh, he was Inaugurated in early 1921, and just a few months later, signs of recovery were already visible. The following year, unemployment was back down to 6.7% and was only 2.4% by 1923. Notice this. These actions taken by President Harding solved the depression in about a year, maybe two. Now, I would like to reveal the real reason for the Depression of 1920. The banking families wanted to force Henry Ford, the automobile maker, into borrowing money to operate his business. Ford had ingeniously created a strategy to avoid the need to borrow money. He supplied his dealers with the cars they could sell without payment until they were sold. Secondly, he kept the prices low enough that the average American could afford one, and he paid his employees more than the going wage for car assemblers. To the bankers, this situation was intolerable. They had to force him into a position of having to need borrowed money to run his business. Now, this is the interesting thing about this activity of the central bankers. Someone must have told Henry Ford that it was the Jewish bankers that had tried to bankrupt him so that he needed to borrow. Apparently, someone also provided him with a copy of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, and he read them and believed the Jews were out to control the world. He purchased the Dearborn, Michigan Independent newspaper, and he used it as a way of educating its readers about the Jewish problem. He serialized the protocols in his paper for 91 weeks and then published them all together in a book entitled The International Jew. It's been reported that Mr. Ford was able to sell 500,000 copies of the book. When Mr. Ford heard that Adolf Hitler, the head of the German government, was also concerned about the Jewish people, he decided to help him in his quest for power. 
This is a photograph taken July the 30th, 1938, of Mr. Ford receiving the Grand Cross of the German Eagle from Adolf Hitler's Third Reich, presented by the German Consul General of Cleveland and the Council of Detroit. Of course, this photograph was taken many years after the 1920 Depression, but it shows just how committed Mr. Ford was in attempting to expose the supposedly Jewish members of the central banking establishment. Just for the record, I am not, not, not a believer in the Jewish conspiracy theory that many in America hold to, and in fact, I produced a DVD entitled The Bogus Jewish Conspiracy. The evidence that those who believe in this theory are dramatically wrong. And you can watch this DVD on the internet. Now let me discuss the recession we are currently in in the years of 2013 and why we've not seen anyone end it. President Barack Obama is doing exactly the opposite of what President Harding did. And there is no relief from the effects of the recession. In around nearly four and a half years of his administration, the end of the recession isn't even foreseeable in the near future. One can only wonder why President Obama is not following the successful record of President Harding. And the answer is obvious. Barack Obama does not want to end the recession. And the reason Barack Obama does not want to, to end the recession is because the Federal Reserve does not want him to. This recession is all about prolonging the recession to cause the most harm to the American people. And let me now try to prove that. This is a book entitled The End of Laissez Faire, meaning the free market, the free enterprise system. Written by John Maynard Keynes, perhaps this nation's best known economist of the 20th century. This is what he wrote on page 105 of his book. Vladimir Lenin, by the way, the communist Russian dictator of 1917 to 1923, is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. Lenin was certainly right. There is no sure means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. So now we see that the communists want to destroy the capitalist system by debauching the currency. Now that is happening in America as we speak. Now let me proceed with a brief discussion of the crash of 1929 where billions were lost in the new stock crash. When I was researching my book in the 1970s and 1980s, I looked for explanations as to what might have caused the crash of 1929. I found this book, amongst others, entitled The Great Crash 1929 by John Kenneth Galbraith, and I read it. Mr. Galbraith was described as a Keynesian 
meaning John Maynard Keynes was his hero, and that he, meaning Mr. Galbraith, was a leading proponent of 20th century political liberalism. He served in the administrations of President Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson, all of whom were also leading proponents of 20th century political liberalism. These are his conclusions about the cause of the great crash of 1929 from pages 4, 32, and 172. No one, <laughs> no, no one was responsible for the great crash. There was none who caused it. Although you got to give him credit, he does admit this, and there's a reason I believe for this. Hold on, the Federal Reserve Board was a body of startling incompetence. So no one caused it, but it whatever caused it. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Board was incompetent to prevent it and then stop it. But Galbraith did agree with his hero, John Maynard Keynes, who wrote this in a quotation I read earlier. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. In other words, some people benefit from crashes. This is how Mr. Galbraith put it. The man with the smart money, who was safely out of the market when the first crash came, meaning the beginning of the crash, naturally, <laughs> naturally went in to pick up bargains. In other words, those with the smart money who got out of the stock market before, before the crash started, went back in and bought bargains, meaning stocks at a much lower price. Naturally. In all of my research, I've never found one writer who discussed just who it was who was buying all of these stocks being sold. We always talked about the sellers, but not the buyers. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that for every stock sold, a share is bought. Both of these two economists, Keynes and Galbraith, told us that the people with the smart money, those who got out of the market before the crash happened, went in and naturally, <laughs> naturally bought every stock sold. Maybe, just maybe, that was why the Federal Reserve Board was startlingly incompetent. It was to allow the people with the smart money, naturally, to come back in and buy stocks at a dramatically lower price. And to be perfectly honest with you, I believe that Galbraith did know what caused the crash and that he intentionally, intentionally, intentionally lied. Don't forget, he was, quote, a proponent of 20th century political liberalism, end quote. But I want to make it clear. I found the evidence that the Federal Reserve did plan both of these depressions, and I provided that evidence in my book entitled The Unseen Hand. I will briefly explain just how they created the crash of 1929. First of all, I'm going to round these figures I will present just to make it a little easier to understand. It all started after the Depression of 1920. The Federal Reserve had $34 billion of money in circulation in June of 1920, and each of these figures will be in June of that year. They decreased it to $32 billion in 1921. 33 billion in 1922, 36 billion in 1923, 38 billion in 1924, 42 billion in 1925, 43 billion in 1926, 45 billion in 1927 and a high of $46 billion in 1928. 
Then the Federal Reserve leveled it off to the same $46 billion in June of 1929. They had increased the money supply by 44% from June of 1921 to June of 1929. Now this is how the media contributed to the depression of 1929. They were convincing the public to invest in the stock market where you could become as rich as John D. Rockefeller, perhaps this nation's wealthiest businessman. The Federal Reserve was encouraging the public to borrow some of the increase in the money supply to invest in the stock market. This was what they were doing with the extra money they had increased the money supply by. So you hear that uh, you buy stocks with the assistance of a stockbroker. So you call and make an appointment. You tell him you have $100 that you want to invest in a purchasing stock and that you want to buy one share of Epperson Popsicle Company. Uh, you tell the broker that I recommended this company because <laughs> it, was an, it was an Epperson who invented the Popsicle and you want to share in the good fortunes of the Epperson family. He goes on to explain how the system works. You invest $100 in Epperson Popsicle, and if the stock goes up 10% to $110, you'll make a 10% profit. And you start thinking, boy, this is easy. And then you reassure yourself by thinking that this must be how John D. Rockefeller made his fortune by starting small. But then the stockbroker tells you that the banks are allowing tycoons such as yourself to borrow money to buy stocks. It is called buying on margin. He then explains what that means. You will still invest your $100. But since the margin is 10%, you can borrow $900 and invest the 1000 dollars meaning the 100 plus your 900 to buy 10 shares at $100 a piece then if your 10 shares go up 10% to a total of $1100 you will make a $100 profit which means you will equal your original investment. You can make a 100% profit with just a 10% increase in the price of your stock. Now you can start to see just how you can really become as rich as John D. Rockefeller. So you agree, as all uh, tycoons did, uh, you agree to purchase <laughs> 10 shares for a total of $1,000. Uh, and then the, oops, uh, the the stockbroker then says, "There's there's one more thing that I've got to uh, show you so that you'll understand. The banks are loaning you this money on what they call a 24-hour broker call loan, which means that they can call the broker and ask him to call the loan, and you will have 24 hours to sell your stock and pay off the loan." But all you can think about is the prospect of becoming as rich as John D. Rockefeller. And with the rising stock market, what's the danger? You certainly can sell your stock in 24 hours and pay off the loan. So you leave the broker's office and you start thinking about <laughs> how you're going to buy that yacht you've always dreamed about. And as time passes, the stock market is climbing and everybody's happy. Until, until, until October the 24th, 1929, when the Federal Reserve told the banks to call their 24-hour broker call loans, and stockbrokers all over the country started selling the shares of all of their tycoons, and the stock market started falling rapidly. And all of the tycoons would get a call asking them to come into the office to talk about this. But notice that all of the stockbrokers had to sell their stocks at the same time. And whenever many people start selling their shares at the same time, prices go down. 
Now let's just make up an example to see what happened. When your broker sold your 10 shares of Epperson Popsicle, let's just say that he was able to buy, find a buyer for, say, $400, he would sell your stocks for $400, and he would then give you a check for that amount. He would print, he would point out that the banks had loaned you $900, and they wanted you to return the full amount of the loan. The stockbroker would say, when are you going to come up with the additional $500? And you would say, gee, gee this is all, I know this is all you could get for my 10 shares. I'm really sorry, but the stock market is down, and that's the best you could do. The stockbroker will express his deep concern and then repeat his question. How are you going to come up with the additional $500? This is how the Federal Reserve created the 1929 crash. But notice this, not all tycoons lost money in the crash. Some of them got out of the market in 1928. One such tycoon who did exactly that was Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of President John Kennedy. He got out by selling all of his stock in the winter of 1928 and the spring of 1929, about a year before the stock market crashed. Now, you are not going to presume, of course, that he somehow got advanced information about the coming stock market crash of 1929. We all know that he got out early because he was a shrewd tycoon. And author Gary Allen said this about what he did with his money. The profits he took from the sale of his holdings were not reinvested, but were kept in cash. So after the crash reached the low in prices, the father brought his cash back to the market and started buying at a low price. Yes, indeedy. While the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. Let me now add the comments made by Congressman Lewis McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking Committee from 1920 to 1931, meaning the times of both of these depressions. These are his, his comments made after the crash of 1929. We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever seen. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board of the Federal Reserve Banks. He further amplified his remarks with his comment that the cause of the depression was not an accident. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. His concerns were confirmed by Dr. Carol Quigley in his book entitled Tragedy and Hope, published in 1966. Dr. Quigley was a professor at Georgetown University after teaching at Princeton and Harvard, and he also completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctor's degree at Harvard University. Dr. Quigley got some instant acknowledgement after he was praised by Bill Clinton at the Democrat Party's convention on July the 16th, 1992, during his acceptance speech. And the reason he was, was because he was Bill Clinton's professor at Georgetown from 1964 to 1968. We know that Quigley's book, published in 1966, was required reading for Quigley's courses. So the public can read the book that we know Bill Clinton read. And since he praised Quigley, we know that what Quigley believed in, Clinton believes in. This is what Bill Clinton read in Quigley's book. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim. Nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. 
This system was to be controlled by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret secret agreements arrived at in frequent private private meetings and conferences. And this confirms why the American people do not know much about the Federal Reserve. It is because they operate in secrecy because they're not controlled by the U.S. government. They're controlled by the central banks of the world acting in concert. The Federal Reserve stands convicted by the evidence. But it is more important at this point to discuss other things that Dr. Quigley taught Bill Clinton. He wrote that the financial element was controlled by a much larger and more powerful group that he called the International Anglophile Network. The word Anglophile means that this network is primarily English. This is what he wrote on page 950 of his book. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network. So the banks are controlled by an international network out to control the world through their control of the central banks. And Quigley taught Clinton that this network controls the elections for the presidency of the United States. This is what Quigley wrote on page 73 of Tragedy and Hope. The network expected to control both political parties equally, meaning, of course, they wanted to control both the Democrats and the Republicans. Some of them intended to contribute to both in order to conceal their influence and listen to this comment, America, and allow the electorate to believe they were exercising their own free choice. Notice what both Quigley and Clinton think of the American voter. They believe like this network believes, that we are too stupid to see how they control both candidates for the presidency equally. That means that no matter who we elect, that candidate was controlled by this international network. So let me urge you to stop voting for any of the two major presidential candidates. It simply does not matter who wins the election. They win and we lose. While I'm here discussing the thoughts of Dr. Quigley, I would like to address the concerns that many have that it is the Rothschild banking family that controls the international world of banking because they are wrong. They are wrong. Dr. Quigley identified 12 banking families that control the international world of banking, and this is his list. He said these banking families include Bering, Lazard, Erlanger, Warburg, Schroeder, Seligman, the Spayers, Mirabad, Malay, Fold, and above all, Rothschild and Morgan. Of course, many historians have written about the last two family names, but I would dare say the others are unknown to the American people. Now, what follows is a very devastating bit of information from Dr. Quigley. This is what he wrote. To do this, meaning allow the bankers to control the money supply, it was necessary to conceal or even to mislead both governments and people about the nature of money. This is the movie actor Jack Nicholson in the movie entitled A Few Good Men. 
He was portraying a major in the U.S. Marines who had lied in court stating that he had not issued a specific order. And here he is loudly mouthing the reason he has lied. Nicholson says, you cannot handle the truth. This must be the reason the bankers are lying to us about the nature of money. Now let me bring this all together with a discussion of how this financial element creates money out of nothing. This will be a brief, simplified illustration, hopefully just to keep it easy to understand. There are three principles in this illustration. The President of the United States, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury Department. The process starts when the president requests that each of the departments of the government submit their budget for the next fiscal year. And let's say that it totals in round figures four trillion dollars. He then asks the Internal Revenue Service to submit an estimate of the amount of taxes to be collected during the next fiscal year and let's say that totals three trillion dollars. That means, of course, there will be a budget deficit of $1 trillion. Now, let's assume that the president doesn't know what to do. One of his advisors tells him to call the Federal Reserve, and they will get him the money he needs to bounce the budget. So the president makes a call to the Federal Reserve and says, I need a $1 trillion, $1 trillion. The bank says, we're certainly pleased that we can assist you, Mr. President, and they notify him that they will be happy to accommodate his request. The president tells the Federal Reserve to provide the government with $1 trillion so he can balance the budget. The Federal Reserve then calls the Department of the Treasury and tells them to print $1 trillion in small denomination bills. Notice that this money will be created out of nothing. The Treasury Department prints up the money and then notifies the Federal Reserve that their money has now been printed. The Federal Reserve then calls the President and notifies him that his money is ready. The President tells them to deliver it to the government and the government will deposit it in the federal government's account in the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Federal Reserve then says that they want some evidence of the transfer of the money since they are loaning the money to the government. And the President responds by confessing he doesn't understand. He says, wait a minute, I'm the President of the Federal Government and that I'm calling the Federal Reserve, which means that both of us are part of the Federal Government. And then the Federal Reserve responds by informing the president that he's slightly misinformed. They tell him that the name Federal Reserve is not their entire name. Why, we're called the Federal Reserve Bank. And even though we have the name Federal in our name, we're not part of the federal government. We're a privately owned bank, and just like any other bank, we are in the loaning business and that we will need the government to pay the loan back with an annual rate of interest. And for this loan, they advise the president they will loan him the money at, let's say, 10% interest a year, and that the reason we must charge interest is because we're a bank, and just like any bank, we have bills to pay. And the president says, well, I guess this is the way that this is done. So he asks, what do I do next? And the Federal Reserve responds by saying to the President, have the Treasury Department print up one trillion dollars in bonds as an evidence of the debt. The President then calls the Treasury Department to print up the bonds and instructs them to have the bonds reflect a 10% interest rate a year. The Treasury Department removes the plates they use to print the money and replaces them with the plates to print the bonds. When this is accomplished, the Treasury Department calls the President and advises him that the bonds are now ready for delivery. 
So the president then calls the Federal Reserve and advises them that the bonds are ready. And the Federal Reserve counters by saying that their new money has been printed. <laughs> and they begin the delivery. The trucks from the Treasury Department pass the trucks from the Federal Reserve on the highway. And after each has delivered their cargo, everybody's happy. <laughs> the government now has the money to pay all of their government bills. Their, their budget is balanced. And the Federal Reserve now has a guarantee that the federal government will pay the interest on the bonds so that they can pay their bills. Now let me point out in my example, the amount of money borrowed was $1 trillion, and the amount of annual interest is $100 billion at an, at an interest rate, of course, of 10%. Uh, oh, oh yes, I failed to mention that bonds are issued for a certain period of years, which means that the government will pay $100 billion a year for, say, 20 years. So that means that the total interest will be $2 trillion during the 20-year term. Now, let me explain one additional thing. Paying interest on bonds is not like paying interest on a mortgage. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that you borrowed $10,000 to buy my house. Uh, please do not think that all authors get rich by selling their books. I'm, I'm certainly living proof of that. Uh, <laughs> in fact, this is the sign I made so I could stand on street corners selling my books. Let's just say that the bank loans you the $10,000 and you pay it off with a payment of $100 a month. Some of that money goes each payment to reduce the amount you have to pay back called the principal, and the rest goes for interest. That means that for each $100 payment you make, it reduces the amount of interest you pay each month and increases the amount applied to the principal. But notice this. Under our example, the government pays the same interest each year, but there's no reduction in the amount of interest applied as you make the next payment. The government pays $100 billion each year for 20 years or a total of $2 trillion. And then at the end of the 20 years, the government will be asked to return the $1 trillion that the Federal Reserve loaned them. So that means that the total cost of funding this $1 trillion deficit will be $2 trillion paid in interest plus the $1 trillion payment at the end of 20 years for a total of $3 trillion. But notice this. In this example, the Federal Reserve makes a $2 trillion profit for loaning $1 trillion to the government. Plus, they get to use the $1 trillion that they created out of nothing again in another loan to the government. Ralph Epperson, noted, <laughs> noted international author, says, hey, not, not too shabby. And yes, one more thing. Notice that when the president talks about funding a deficit, he always fails to mention the amount of interest it will cost us taxpayers each year to borrow from the Federal Reserve. I'm sure that is just one little detail that the presidents forget when they discuss the process. Oh, I forgot one little insignificant detail. I do not know for certain if the Federal Reserve loans the federal government $1 trillion in cash that the government will deposit in the Federal Reserve Bank. It might be just a bookkeeping entry transferring the money from the Federal Reserve to the U.S. government. But I do know this. The Federal Reserve pays the Treasury Department for the printing of any money. Marilyn Beausavant discussed this in her February 8, 2009 column in Parade Magazine. She was asked, what does it cost to print U.S. currency? And her answer was, a paper note costs 6.2 cents to print. Now let me explain what she just said. It costs 6.2 cents to print any denomination bill. 
The Federal Reserve loans the $100 bill to the U.S. government, and it costs them 6.2 cents to print it. That is a profit of approximately $99.94 to loan the U.S. government $100 in cash. Uh, once again, uh, Professor Epperson, not too shabby. So let me summarize this whole subject of funding the national debt. When the government borrows the money from the Federal Reserve, it causes debt, meaning we have to pay the Federal Reserve back, just like a private citizen does when they borrow money from a bank. It causes inflation when the Federal Reserve puts this new money into circulation. And it costs us in interest payments, just like anyone has to pay when they borrow money. That doesn't sound like much of a bargain to me. This transaction causes debt, inflation, and interest. But there are at least three other ways to fund a deficit budget. The second way would be to borrow from the American people. This was one of the ways that President Franklin Roosevelt funded World War II. Hollywood actors and actresses like Joan Crawford went on national bond drives encouraging the American people to loan money to the government as a way to pay a part of the costs of the war. This method does cost debt because the taxpayers have to pay the money back. It does not cause inflation because there is no increase in the amount of money in circulation. But it causes interest payments that the taxpayers have to pay the American people who loan their money to the government. A third way would be for the government to put the printing plates that print paper money on the printers and then just print it. This method does not cause debt since nothing has been borrowed. It causes inflation because it increases the money supply but it does save the taxpayers interest payments. And the fourth way would be to tax the people, declaring that if you want the services, you have to pay for them. This method does not cause debt because nothing is borrowed. It does not cause inflation because it is not an increase in the money supply. And it does not cause interest payments because nothing is borrowed. Now this is a table showing the four methods that are available to the U.S. government when it has a deficit budget. Which one is the worst way, as far as the taxpayers are concerned, to fund the deficit? Of course, number one, borrowing from the Federal Reserve. And yet the government consistently chooses method number one, the worst possible way to fund a deficit. Now, which is the best way to fund a deficit budget as far as the taxpayers are concerned? Is it, of course, it is, of course, method number four, because it does not cause debt, inflation, and interest. But government never chooses that method because tax increases are not popular. Now we can begin our study of the recession America is currently in. This is an article that appeared in the New York Times newspaper on September the 30th, 1999, and it states that Fannie Mae, the government-sponsored enterprise that keeps money flowing to the housing and mortgage markets, will, en will encourage banks to extend home mortgages to individuals whose credit is generally not good enough to qualify for conventional loans. Notice that the government is encouraging the banks to make loans to people that they know will not pay them back. There's not a banker in the world who will make loans that he knows will not be repaid. Yet the government is urging him to do so. The article then says that Fannie Mae is, quote, under pressure from the Clinton administration, meaning the administration of President Bill Clinton, to expand the number of these loans that the boat banks make. That means the Clinton administration was urging the banks to knowingly lose money. 
By the way, <laughs> please notice that nearly everyone in this picture except the women standing to the left is wearing black, the color traditionally worn when you attend a funeral. Were Bill Clinton and the cabinet members wearing black as if they were attending a funeral? Uh, <laughs> perhaps they know something we didn't know. But the article then quotes an expert on mortgage loans as saying, if they fail, the government will have to step up and bail them out. Notice that this expert used the words, bail them out. The man put his finger on the entire scheme. The Clinton administration knew it was going to fail. And that there was a planned, quote, bailout, end quote, in the future. Let me explain the process on how this works. Step number one, the banks make the bad loans. They know they will be bailed out. And sure enough, in step number two, Fannie Mae bails them out so that the banks do not lose money. Step number three, Fannie Mae goes to the government and says, wait a minute, we need to be bailed out so we don't lose money. And sure enough, the government bails them out. Step number five, the government needs to be bailed out. So they borrow the money from the Federal Reserve so the government doesn't lose money. Step number seven, the Federal Reserve needs to be bailed out and they get paid back by step number eight, the taxpayers. So the Federal Reserve does not lose money. Step number nine, the only party to this pre-planned sequence that does not get bailed out are the taxpayers. We get no bailout. So the American people lose their jobs and their homes. Just as planned, this article laid out the entire plan. It was started by the Clinton administration. The entire thing worked, and it's working today. And Barack Obama is smiling. So in conclusion, we've seen how central banks have been at the core of our wars and depressions since the American Revolution. But I must hasten to point out that this conspiracy is not made up of just central bankers. Fifty years of my research has absolutely convinced me that it is 6,000 years old and has been in every culture and on every continent for that length of time. I would recommend that you consider watching my four-hour DVD entitled The New World Order Finally Explained on YouTube. Now let me end with this little story. There once was a very stupid man who tried to trick a very wise man. He put a peanut in its shell in his hand and then clenched his fingers to conceal the peanut from you. He approached the wise man and said to him, I will ask you one question, and by your answer, I can tell if you are indeed a wise man. And then he showed the wise man his clenched fist. He asked the wise man this question. Is the peanut in my hand in the shell, or is it outside the shell? Thinking that if the wise man said it is in the shell, he would crunch the peanut and then open his hand to reveal that it was outside the shell. If the wise man said it is outside the shell, he would open his fingers to reveal that it was inside the shell. The wise man thought for a few moments and then said, The event is in your hand. Truly wise men today will see that the future of their world 
is in their hands. Thank you so very much. And may God bless America. <laughs>